Evening guys, it's Outlaw Colin here, tonight with the second part of our American Werewolf in London special, which we'll get to very shortly, uh, but tonight I'm joined by Outlaw Paul. Hello everybody, and no, I'm not wearing the same shirt as last week. <laughs> and Outlaw Alan. Hi everybody, yep, and I am wearing the same shirt as I was wearing last week. Yeah, so am I, it's weird, really <laughs> just so am I, so am I. Yeah, it. <laughs> So tonight is the second part of our American Werewolf in London special, uh, and I think we're so lucky to get her. We've got uh, Lindsay Drew Honey on the show tonight. Uh, if you're familiar with the film, which I'm sure you all are, you'll know she played Brenda Bristols uh, in the infamous See You Next Wednesday slot that plays in the cinema scene. Uh, but aside from American Werewolf in London, she's got a plethora of acting credits, modelling credits, writing credits uh, and we're really looking forward to uh going to some depth to talk to her about these so uh, i welcome to the podcast lindsay drew honey firstly if i just kick off because we were having a little chat before the break it wasn't my first question but i think it's really good uh brenda bristols where where did that come from well i am from bristol i don't know if you know that and um when i went for the audition and i met john landis he an American, I think he could actually um, tell that I had a different accent than most of the other people he was meeting in London. So he asked me where I was from, and I told him I was from Bristol. And I don't know how he knew that, because in Bristol, you know, Bristol cities, titties, is a, <laughs> a, a, a slang going on there. But, you know, the, the, when I went for the part, it wasn't called Brenda Bristol's, it was just girl in a porno, I guess. And... Um, John thought it was quite a sort of a good, fun name, and he came up with that. Well, I didn't know. I mean, when the film came out, I then was Brenda Bristols. I can't remember at what point he told me I was going to be Brenda Bristols, because when I did the movie part, I had to go back to do the studio grunting and groaning. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, great. I, 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 was, I mean, I must have been about 23, I think. But I'm, I mean, I've never done anything like that before. I've never gone in a studio with an engineer and John Landis and, and you know, had to do all the, ah, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, and obviously <laughs> because, I mean, in the movie it was probably, actually it was quite long because it went over the, the entire segment, didn't it? I saw it recently yeah. at um, Dark Fest and I introduced it and um, I had I thought, oh, well, I'm in it for a few seconds. But actually, the, the bit, the see you next... Tuesday is actually quite short but then the bit in the the movie theatre goes on for quite a long time with me doing the orgasmic um uh, soundtrack throughout which went on for about seven minutes I, <laughs> so I think I did in the studio with John Landers and the engineer I was probably at it for about half an hour <laughs> <laughs> so just going embarrassing so so just going back on that did you know at the audition that it was a film Within a film, was that made clear or? Yes, it was sure? actually. I went along to the film studios in Twickenham. My model agent sent me along, and um, I was told John Landis. I mean, in those, those uh, you know, now I mean, my son's an actor, and he goes to a casting director. Then you'll see maybe the director. Then you'll read with the actor that you're doing something with. But at this date, I just went when I went to see. Um, John Landis, it was to see John Landis, nobody else, you know, I mean, my only audition was with John Landis and being John Landis is, I mean, a very articulate man. He just explained the whole film to me um, and this one section in it where they wanted to make this point, um, I guess, where it was like, you know, kill yourself, you know, sever the wolf's vein, you know, and all the time, you know, there's this little sex funny thing running through it because... When you said it's going to be funny and it's really scary, I thought, well, oh, that sounds a bit unusual, you know. But it actually, I, I don't know, there's not many films that actually have got the humour of American Werewolf in London, but it's actually, there's some really scary bits in it. So he did explain all that to me quite clearly, you, you know, he, he did go through everything. And um, and I was, yeah, great, you know. And, and I think he actually offered me the role then and there, I think, actually. Oh, good. Yeah, when I went along for the, the um, meeting with him, yeah. So you've been offered the role. Uh, from what I gather, I think it was quite a cold 
time of year and you didn't know all the people that you were working with or you knew one of them I think did you so was there just to build a bit of repartee there I didn't really know anybody there I think I, I mean I, I knew of Dave Cooper Gypsy Dave um but I don't know how I knew of him maybe I just knew you know I'd seen him at other things or auditions or something but no I didn't know anyone and I think they did shoot it mainly in the winter because I remember being told when they shot the stuff on the moors and that it was just absolutely you know ice on the ground and and you know the, these american actors weren't used to sort of working in those kind of conditions but we were just in a very big studio in twickenham so um and of course i was a nude model so i being naked or anything like that didn't bother me at all really i mean you know there was crew there and they didn't have a close set i'm pretty sure um but i think everybody who was working on that sort of scene at Tuesday, that little scene. No, no one seemed to be embarrassed. We were naked and it was, you know, it was OK. Just just wait a second, because I, I think Paul's got to go and take his blood pressure tablets. He's, 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 looking, a bit, he's, he's looking a bit peaky there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to just interject with a little story, but um, um, one of the um, first times I had to watch that, my brother made me watch it when I was a young child. And then the next time I watched it was when uh, my dad was sitting um, and watching it on the, the TV. And that wonderful scene came up with your um, narrated soundtrack yes. and your panting. <laughs> and my dad was looking rather awkward for a number of minutes while I'm going to him. What's that about? What's that about? <laughs> it's interesting. I, and I, I think it's fair to say it's probably the most watched part of most of the VHSs <laughs> of America Werewolf in London, if, if we're going to be open and honest. <laughs> Because it's, it's like 40 years old nearly now, isn't it? Um, um, about 39 years, 39 years old, I think it is. And as I say, I hadn't watched it for about 10 years. And I watched it re re recently and I just thought, I had no idea that that panting scene just went on for so long. I mean, obviously I wasn't on screen, but I, my, my voiceover was over the whole of that cinema Um the actual scene itself is hysterically funny as well as as far as a soft porn goes it yes. is it is a class you know you've only got a few minutes put a hysterically funny storyline in and it and it was nailed it was really it was a really funny yes. and there's that line yeah. i can't remember it was david northman and griffin dunn it's like nice movie he's in the middle of <laughs> several the, the vein nice movie <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was so funny I, mean, I can't believe that I made. I had a, a one day shoot and a couple of hours voiceovers on a movie thirty nine years ago, and I'm still I'm doing conventions and do, I'm still talking about it. I mean, it's it's amazing, really, because it is it's a cult classic. You know, it's um, it, it, that's why forty years later here I am talking about it. Yeah, um, yeah. And and Colin, if you don't mind me interjecting, it oh, is my okay. eldest brother's favourite film of all time. And as we said in the previous podcast, um, my brother, if he was on this podcast, would faint immediately um, <laughs> because um, I th and I and I think it's fair to say in all of our podcasts that we've done previously, if you were to talk about iconic horror movies, yes, you can talk about the modern classics of the Nightmare on Elm Street and the big you know epic storyline but always 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 when anybody mentions america werewolf in london the whole room goes oh yeah mm. yeah so, yeah it yeah. was it was the that that one of those early films that just it took you on a roller coaster of emotions and was really gory and funny and and had everything in it love story i'd rarely seen uh, in my youth something yeah, that combined so many different yeah, it genres. was a complete movie really wasn't it yeah mm. with the love story and you know the ending is very sad and you know and jenny agatha is awesome i think in it well yeah. you know the cast are all great but you know she played that so so well. and the music going through it is great as well and yeah, the score's uh, epic yeah so it's yeah. a great thing to be involved with and and um and the nice thing about it even though i had a little tiny part in it john landis when he was here over from america there was often um you know a premiere thing and we all got invited to it even people had tiny little parts in it and um yeah, it was a really good thing to, I think that was the first, I think that was probably the first, I did, I've done a few little bits and pieces in film, I think that was probably the first thing I did, just um, on wise. Just on the premiere, you mentioned about the uh, the premiere, first you're just going back to your scene, I, I think the lines that you deliver are so deadpan funny, that also helps as well, I mean you, you talked about your Griffin's line, but I think your lines in, the, in, in that shot are so delivered, so deadpan, that really helps yeah. as well, it really yeah. makes it laugh. Uh, so they're really good. Uh, 
we were just speaking to uh, Michael Carter. I don't know if you overlapped with him he's, during the filming. No, I did. But he's the guy in the chocolate bar with the escalator. That's right. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. Terrifying. Brilliant scene on the escalator. I just, you know, that the way it's shot. I love that scene. And the way he eats that thick brick of chocolate. There's just something about it. <laughs> <Yeah. that. I laughs> <laughs> So just just going on the you were saying you get invited to the uh, the uh, premieres. I was doing a little bit of research, and forgive me because you might not remember this, but I did pick up on a slightly funny story from the premieres where you were sat beside a, a certain certain person who, shall we say, had a bit of an infatuation with uh, women's assets. I don't know if you remember that side a certain person who was staring at but no, who, no. So, i wasn't there i wasn't there so Colin. paul wasn't paul could fulfill that role but <laughs> yeah the, i was gonna say the way the story goes is that uh you believed you may have been slightly slightly tricked because you were sat beside one of the actors you played one of the homeless characters oh, uh, no. and he had a bit of an uh, lure for you <laughs> The old boy, I mean, he must have been about 90, played one of the homeless tramps, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to, there was some big launch thing, and, and I sat next to him, and, and he smoked throughout the whole of dinner. That was the one thing. I, he, he stared at my bosom and smoked cigarettes. <laughs> two hours. So, yeah, I got placed very um, indiscriminately, I think, really. That was, yeah, he did. Actually, I didn't mind him staring at my boobs, but it was the smoking I didn't like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm not a smoking fan. Yeah. Yeah, God rest his soul, he can't be alive now. He was very old and that was 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah, no, God rest him, you're right. Yeah, fair play to him. Uh, another story, sorry I've been stalking you a bit through uh, various books and the internet. Uh, I believe when you were filming your scene that uh, Twickenham, at the same time John Landis was doing a bit of a promo for the film or something oh, for in Festers. He did because he, he did this little promo when we'd finished filming for the day and he put up some flats so that we were, the four of us in the, you know, though, though you didn't really see the other girl very much at all in it, there was a guy called Lucian, Dave Gypsy Cooper, another um, young lady and myself. So John put these flats up and he was talking about how he'd written this. It was the first thing he ever wrote when he was like 22 or something. And, you know, he said, oh, I've written this movie and it's very scary. And, you know, you'll be terrified. And, you know, it, it's it's a little bit funny. And with that, he was talking about how he'd written it. And then the flats just fell down. And in, in, in the background, on the bed, there were the four of us, all supposedly naked, having sex, <laughs> and jumping up and down the bed, you know. And I think he used that as a promotional thing when he was doing... <laughs> it's really scary. Oh, it's quite funny as well. You know, I've got these four people here all pretending to have sex. And it was like over the top sex. You know, we were all like jumping up and down really mad. And, you know, so that was something he used. I don't know why that. Um, and actually, did I see that? Yes, I think some I saw it because it was on some outtake or something I saw. I never saw that until really recently, how it was actually where it went or anything. But yeah, that was just something John wanted to do at the to, to do at the end. Because I think he, John Landis was quite young, actually, when he, um, mm. he was only, was he 27 or 29 or, yeah, he was... Something like that, yeah, uh, I think yeah, mid or late 20s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was, so, because um, I think he'd done a couple of, he did Animal House or something like that previously. Or yeah, yeah. The record, track record, but I think this was kind of the first thing, the first thing he'd ever written, I think, that's why he was sort of so, you know so excited about it and uh, yeah as i say i think the fact that it was so funny and so scary just i don't think i'd seen a little movie like that before good uh what i was when i was doing a little bit of uh digging into your career it actually this is quite extensive I, i'm well, glad i've done a little bit of research it's extensive although it's funny because i went to this convention the dark fest a couple of years ago and um Everyone was coming up and bringing me things to sign because I'm a friend of Alan Bryce who runs it. So I people were bringing me up all these things for me to sign. And I was with a friend of mine who's like a real horror fan. And he said, oh, you've done a few bits of your lint. I said, oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've done. Because <clears throat> my career has been a long time. You know, I started in my, at 20 and I was still doing, you know, well, I was doing a lot of stuff. You know, I just was, I, I would do some modelling. I do stripping and I do any acting. Not that I could act really you know but I mean I, I could deliver the odd line you know I, I've never think of myself as an actress 
And um, so when I actually looked to see what I had done, I thought, actually, I've done quite a lot, really. Yeah, so I have done quite a lot of bits and pieces over the years. Yeah. So how would you compare American Werewolf in, in London to all of your experience? I mean, it was your first, so I guess it's got a special place there. But was it generally comparable or was that probably your most fun? It was very, it was really fun. It was really nice. There was nothing difficult. As I say, I, I didn't do a new modelling, so I wasn't bothered about being naked. Everyone on set was really <coughs> nice and respectful and that was really good. But I actually said I didn't really have any sort of bad times on, on film sets, really. Um, you know, I did a lot of work with Ken Russell, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the stuff with Ken Russell was a little bit more difficult because I did The Lair of the White Worm, which I presume is a horror movie. Yeah. yeah. And at one point, you know, me and three other girls, we were dressed as nuns and we were supposed to be on stake. So we were on a stage, you know, led on our backs as though we were staked through the back with the makeup artists, uh, makeup designers just coming in for fake blood all over us, you know. <laughs> that wasn't comfortable. That wasn't nice, you know. It was, it was everything to work on. It was nice, but it was a difficult job. Do you know what I mean? We, we were doing some very weird things because it was that kind of that different sort of movie. So but actually, American Werewolf in London was very easy. Just getting naked and lying in bed. You know, that sounds like a good... <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good gig to me. It's, it's, yes, it does, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's uh, funny that you talk about the uh, uh, hassles of the fake blood we had. Michael Carter, of course, he's in the cinema scene watching your film. Of course, he is, yeah. And he's dead, but of course he's not decomposed or he's, he's not chased, so he's covered in blood. He's rotting as the scene carries on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. John, he, he, he said John Landis was absolutely just obsessed with getting fake blood everywhere, pouring oh, it on their yeah. heads, <laughs> pouring it on the furniture. He said it, it was just everywhere. And because where they filmed it, uh, for some reason they had the windows and the doors open, it's, it just gets hardening on their faces and it causes them real grief. So I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, that, yeah. It, it, it's not comfortable and also I don't know what your head does to you. I did a film with another film with Ken Russell called Aria and in Aria um, I was supposed to be a crash victim. Have you heard of Aria? It's, 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 it's not a horror film it, but mine was a bit horrible but it's a, it's, it's a film done by about 12, 10 different directors and they all do one Aria from an opera and I was the lead in Ken Russell's one. Oh. It was about a car crash victim. So I spent about a week, we it took a week, it was only nine minutes or something, but it was a, a, they had a Pontiac car overturned on the side and I was underneath the car just being lashed down with blood, lashed down with water the whole time. So I spent a week led under a car and I'm quite claustrophobic, I really didn't like <laughs> this car that was on this, you know, is up this way, you know, two wheels because it had turned over. So I spent a week, I, I'm there, I was just being, you know, just they sort of put blood all over me and then, oh, it's drying out, let's put more water on, you know. And I, I think maybe directors, when they're going to do it with blood, yeah, let the more the merrier with them. <laughs> and it's not a nice feeling because in your head, um, and then another time I'd look in the scenes, I was looked like I was all stitched up and all this, my face and everything. But when you look in the mirror, I don't know what it is with blood. It made me think it was real blood. My, you know, it's my head was doing funny things that I could almost faint looking at myself. It was that hideous. Really. Oh wow! So it's yeah. pretty good makeup then. <laughs> yeah, really good makeup. You know, and I just had sort of like stitches and blood, and nobody would sit opposite me at lunch. You know, at lunch you <laughs> on a coach or a bath, and you take your cater in there and you sit there, and everyone's like. No, I can't sit next to you because I was like really gory. <laughs> well, that film did well. It was nominated for a Palm Door at the Cannes Film Festival in 1987. Oh, Aria, was it? Yeah, oh, it was wow. nominated for a Palm Door. And, and, and generally, you know, they don't put bad films um, oh, no, for those was. sorts of awards. So it's evidently, it got the nomination. It didn't win it, but it, it got nominated. So um, um, Nick, Nicholas Rogue did it. Um, Julia yeah, Robert Pet Altman. <clears throat> And they had a lot of big actors, you know, there's a lot of big, uh, John Hurt was in one of the scenes, wasn't he? And um, Teresa Russell, who was big at the time, and the woman from Airplane, the comedy, you know, the woman who's like um, the lead love in that movie Airplane, which is one of my, my big films. Because I'm not really a horror movie fan, I have to say. I don't know if your fans want to hear that, but, you know, I, I, haven't, watched, I haven't watched Nightmare on Elm Street and a lot of these 
big horror movies. And it's weird because I've got so many friends who are so into the horror genre and they say, oh, what about that? And I'm like, sorry, I've never seen it. So I have to go away and watch a few of those. But <laughs> horror, it was a great idea. And Ken Russell's segment I thought was very good. I mean, yeah, it was really... Because he, he had a... His um, personal assistant had been... A, in a horrible car crash and I don't know if she passed away or if she was okay but he had this idea that as you float between life and death you go off into a sort of fantasy kind of thing and that's what you know while I was lying under the car off I went into various fantasies you know in, in diet all my blood became jewels and all that kind of thing so yeah it was it's quite beautifully done really um, well, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up because I'll be honest I haven't seen it but it's definitely on my list now to definitely see uh, because it sounds really, really good, and all the different segments make it seem like it'd be quite an experience yeah, to watch. And there's, there's, there, I think there's ten. I think there's ten segments. I'm not sure, but you know, and some are fantastic, and some you think you can get that. But you know, that's the same with a lot of things, isn't it? Really? Yeah. I think one of, one of the good things about a lot of these um, uh, lesser known movies, if if I can say that, is um, is access them now in the digital world. You know, a lot of, of people course, yeah. obviously went VHS, Laserdisc, DVD, Blu-ray. Now it's all digital. And a lot of things do get left almost on a shelf, don't they? They don't get released for the modern consumer, the modern audience to digest and appreciate. Never mind the fact that lots of fans of these iconic, smaller indie movies, especially yeah. in the 80s, have so yeah. many made. Yeah. And the fans now are desperate for them to be re-released, restored, you know, to the original director's vision, 4K quality. Well, there must be such a backlog. They were off in London, didn't they? About, um, well, when the, um, they made the documentary Beware the Moon, I don't know if you've seen Beware the Moon? Yeah. yeah. But when they made Beware the Moon, they had it at Fright Fest in Leicester Square. So it was actually shown, the, the documentary, and then on the big screen, they showed American Werewolf in London. And I think it had just been done to Blu-ray about 10 years ago. HD and it amazing and it just sort of still held up it was strange because I was in the audience and they they said anyone who's involved with the film you know afterwards come up on the stage and I went up on the stage well I was probably the youngest person working on it at 23 so I went up on the stage and we were all so old you know I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, was, there were very few people under 60 I was under 60 then but you know 10 years ago I mean there was a lot of people older than me you know, and then we went on the stage and answered questions and I just thought, you know, it just brings it back how long ago that film was actually made, you know, and, and 40 years ago nearly. It's it's um, it's just, yeah, it doesn't seem it when you watch it. It still stands up to this day, I think. And you're still being quizzed on it as well. That's, yeah, that, that was going to be my question. Yeah, how's that feel yeah. to still be quizzed on it sort of yeah. some 40 years later? Yeah. Give me a resurgence of a career, <laughs> 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 conventions and stuff. Yeah, so you know, which I like doing, so that's good. Yeah, conventions are always a good note. Um, I've got a, um, a kind of an off the wall question, really, a bit of a random one to shake things up. Um, if let's see if I can word this correctly. Um, if you could pick one, because you've had an illustrious career, you've done quite a lot of stuff, which is which is good. But yeah. if you could, if if you could have uh, one thing that you could go back in your career and redo, or maybe even something that you would like to star in, what would that be? Oh, dear, I don't know. I thought I'd change it up a bit, oh, lad. Sorry. No, it's good. It's, good. it's all good. I have to say, I can't act. I mean, let, let's. Let, I couldn't star in anything much because I really can't act. I do a lot of self-tapes with my son, you know, when he's doing self-tapes for auditions. I will be set up the camera and I'm the person reading all the other lines. And when I listen to him back, it, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly... Um, I, I, in my head, I'm thinking, right, I've got to say it at the right moment, pause it this time, remember the lines. I mean, I don't know how actors just do monologues and things. I find it quite... Uh, amazing but i mean what would i like well i'd like to have been in the carry on film that would have been fun oh yes oh, yeah. great choice yeah. great yeah. choice yeah. Yeah. yeah cope with that because you know the acting was very tongue-in-cheek so any tongue-in-cheek acting yeah. i could probably manage so um yeah i'd like to have been in uh carry on stripping i'd have been in <laughs> <laughs> let's let's get an online petition that's it let's get that started <laughs> let's get it made we've got to get a hashtag going Lindsay, carry, carry on <laughs> yes yes exactly we'll do that yeah so that's something that um 
I would like to, because I think the Carry On films are, are great. I mean, that, they're just they're yeah. iconic, aren't they? They're, they're yeah. part of Brit- oh, British oh, yeah. law, British Institute. Yeah. Um, I don't know anyone who didn't grow up watching them and loving them and laughing and. They were just a great 90 minutes away from whatever problems you had in life and they would just laugh out loud. There was nothing... I mean, if you made them now, you'd probably get slaughtered for political incorrectness, but oh, well, they were harmless. Sure. Yeah, I mean, PC gone mad, really, but, I mean, you, would, you wouldn't be able to... I mean, a lot of the shows now that are on television that, you know, some of Only Fools and Horses, before they show that, they put a warning on there because yeah. the old boy calls a woman a bird or something. You know, yeah. it's <laughs> Yeah. Isn't it strange how uh, that is true? Because I know there was a campaign recently where they were people were saying that the BBC and UK Gold shouldn't be showing Only Fools and Horses anymore. I know. Because it's, 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 it's insensitive, which is insane. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah, PC, I think it's gone way too far. So, yeah. Indeed. OK, so carry on. Yeah, carry on stripping. That sounds like a great one. I think yeah. we should um, I think really Alan, have a word. So <laughs> you were talking about your acting abilities and I don't know if you're being true to yourself because I'm, again I have to confess I've not seen uh, another film I'm going to briefly talk about The Rainbow Thief I don't know how much you remember about being in that yes but I remember quite a lot you, that, actually but, yeah but because you're credited uh, beside Peter O'Toole uh, Omar Sharif and Christopher Lee I mean this is an amazing you know <laughs> bunch of people and there you are as well and it was called The Rainbow Thief and I was Madame Rainbow I mean yeah. it was, I was Madame Rainbow and I had all these because uh, I was about 31, 2 when I did that film. And um, so I had all these sort of page three girls who were all like six, seven, eight years younger than me. And I was like the madame, I think. I was, you know, they were sort of call girls and I was looking after this as far as I can remember because I didn't know the story, but I was just booked. And and it was very strange. It was, um, it was filmed, I think it was somewhere around Denham. I, I don't know if it was Denham Studios, but it might have been around there. And, um, and it was night shoots, you know, we had to go at six o'clock at night and we worked at six o'clock the next morning, wow. you know, like 12 hours overnight shoots, which I don't know, it was, it was a, um, I don't know, I don't know if you, really, you have special licenses for all that sort of overnight, um, longer hours than, you know, 12 hours, I think we went longer than that sometimes, but I was very lucky because all, it was freezing as well and all the other girls were wearing baths and stockings and suspenders and I've got this, I'm really into my leopard skin, I've got this massive, and I've had it then, so I've still got this coat 30 years later, um, this massive leopard skin coat, fake fur coat, and they, and I, they, when I sort of said I had it, they still wear that, so I thought this is great, because I'm in my underwear, freezing my butt off, but I've actually got a massive <laughs> coat on as well. So I remember thinking that coat was amazing, and I remember being Christopher Lee, being a right miserable, person. He was, <laughs> so, I mean, he's passed away now, so I can say that. But he was so moany. I mean, and um, and I remember this was a long time ago, and we were I was getting really good money. Um, so this was thirty years ago, and I was on a thousand pound a night, which you know it was wow. nice. I was on a thousand pound like thirty wow. years. Ago. And they were quite untogether, so I was only booked for like two nights, and it went on to five. So I was like rubbing my hands <laughs> like that before. You know, it was just unheard of, and I don't know why. And I think Christopher Lee was moaning, and I mean, he's a big star, but he was on about twenty grand a night or something. And I thought <laughs> if I was on twenty grand a night, I'd just I'd lie naked outside, you know, with all the girls <laughs> around me. But, you know, it was just it was some. Um, yeah, that was one of those that wasn't easy to do because of the cold, but I was lucky because I had a big... And there was all these great Danes in it as well. I had no idea. They had masses of dogs in the... They had about... When you'd go into the green room where everyone was just hanging when we weren't doing anything, there was... Um, I think there was like six great Danes. That, there were some dogs in the, the film. I, I, I haven't seen the whole film at all. I saw... I did a one-woman show at the Phoenix Theatre about 18 months ago. I joined Misty Moon Film Society and Stuart, the guy who runs it, asked me to do a one woman show and I'm like, no, I can't do this, but anyway, he's a lovely chap and he said, yes, you can, and I did it. And the guy, Martin, who does all the clips, he got the load of clips from all the things I'd done and that was the first time I'd ever seen The Rainbow Thief and the bit, that the clip that they used was just me outside with the girls. I think we were getting out of some posh car, a big open top car or something. And um, that's the only bit of the film I've seen, just me like herding the girls into wherever. Oh, and there was a bit where I was dancing with Christopher Lee. We had to dance with Christopher Lee and, 
and carry him around. And oh god, he was foaming. <laughs> <laughs> so you've carried around as Superman. It's not many are going to be able to, to say that. So you've been in an Oscar winning film because America we're all in London won an Oscar, albeit for its makeup and well deserved. You've yes, been a, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, you've been in a Palm Door nominated film. And I had a lead in that, a small lead. You had a little small lead. And you work with S Superman. So I think that's a pretty, for someone who says they can't act, that's a pretty good yeah. uh, well, resume right there, I think. I um, I can't do any accents or I can't do anything like that. I can only do this accent, Brenda Bristol. That's the other <laughs> yeah. No, that's brilliant. that's brilliant. I think we touched on this earlier, but I'll just ask it again uh, because we asked... Uh, Michael as well, so it's good to get a, another view. Uh, as we said, the film does turn 40 next year. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, did you ever think you'd be talking about it 40 years later? Or do you think it'd be destined for the bargain basement? Well, I had no idea, really, because, you know, you just... Because, basically, I was just on that for one day and a few hours. So it was just, you know, I had no idea at all, apart from the fact that I did think, you know, when I saw it, I thought, wow, this is, you know, really quite special. But no, you, you, you would have no idea at all, really, would you? Just no idea. I was just really pleased to get a nice little part where people were really nice. The money was OK. I had a nice time on set, um, got invited to a few nice parties afterwards, you know. But the idea, of, even when it was, um, you know, when they made the... Um, Beware the Moon, and they contacted me and asked me to sort of be interviewed for that. You know, I thought, well, this is like 25 years later or something. I'm being asked to talk about a film I made 25 years ago. Um, so I was quite shocked even to be talking. And then when it was shown on the big screen at Leicester Square at, at Fright Fest, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it really. No, and I was like, yeah, it's, it's, I'm there with people. And they say, who's in this film? Come down, you know, come down. I'm like, well, that's me. I'm on my way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely, no, definitely, well, yeah. It's been, it, you know, it's, it's been something in my life that's been really good. Never thought it would happen, but if I, I'm happy to be talking about it now. And it was a great experience at the time. And, I, and I've seen John Landis several times. It, um, oh, I, right. I, I bumped into him at, like, um, he was at a, a kid's BAFTA I went to with my son. And my son was presenting a BAFTA, and, and John was presenting a BAFTA. And it was just weird, you know, I saw him after, oh, um, well, I saw him at Fright Fest about 30 years after the movie, and then I saw him about three years later than that. And it was strange because I was stood with this producer of this kids show that my son did, a, a lady. And I said, oh, John Landis is here. You know, I did American Werewolf in London um, like 30 odd years ago. I must go and say hello to him. She said, well, would he remember you? And I said, yeah, he'll remember me. And he came out and went, hello, <laughs> Lindsay. And he walked past me and went, hello, Lindsay, how are you? <laughs> producer from this kids show she nearly fainted i had seen him about two years previously which i didn't tell her Good. so yeah i didn't tell her and i said yeah you remember me and he went hello Lindsay, how are you and i just thought i was so cool this producer was like oh man brilliant brilliant so in addition to your film work uh i understand you've written a couple of books as well you've I've managed to turn about, around some books well i've written about five books but I, I, oh wow well when i was editor of penthouse i wrote a couple of like I wrote uh, Lindsay Drew's Pleasure Guy, <laughs> which was like... Calm down, Paul. Calm down. <laughs> I'm down. steaming my glasses. <laughs> and, uh, that was published by Virgin Books. And then I, I actually did, because I was editor of Penthouse and I used to get so many sort of letters written to me, I just I just compiled them all and made a, you know, a sexy letters book from the, what people had written to me, although I had to change them around a bit because they did get a bit monotonous. <gasps> and then, and then, and then. So <laughs> I, I chose the best ones and sort of edited it. So I did that. Um, and then I wrote an autobiography when I was 33. Oh. Um, but then I hadn't written a book until 2016. Well, I think when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, I read the books and I thought, mm, I could do this obviously not successfully but you know I just thought I set myself a challenge I always wanted to write a novel and I always wanted to write because I'm very into sort of Agatha Christie type thrillers and American thrillers and um, cops with a bit of character about them you know type of um, storylines and um, so I've never got around to doing that but I just when this sort of genre of sexy book came in I thought that'd be something I could actually probably do a lot easier than a, a, a crime thriller. So I, I wrote my first one in 2016, which is uh, Every Shade of Blue. I've got it here. I'll show you. <laughs> well, we've, 
We'll do a plug for that definitely. Yeah, we'll like, so I've got every shade of uh, every shade of blue, and then I did every shade of blue. Black. So one came out in 2016, one came out in 2019, and they were pretty well received. I didn't really, you know, I've missed the boat. By the time I actually finished them, you know, Fifty Shades was like out in about 2010, I think, or something, 2012, or I can't remember. By the time I actually finished them, got offered a deal, but it was by a company that didn't have a terribly good reputation. And then I sort of, people said, why don't you self-publish it? So I did self-publish it, but I'm not very good at promoting it. That was kind of you know, I think it was a bit my downfall, really. I didn't promote it terribly well. I didn't sort of um, really know what to do. I can sit down and write the book, but when, you know, and it's very personal to you. I don't know if you, you know, if you write stuff and that, you know, it's what you feel like. Does everyone say, well, this, this is shit. And then you just be like, no, I spent so long on that kind of thing. And I didn't have any particular, you know, I had a couple of five star reviews and, you know, it did it did pretty well. And I like lots of people who know me like, did you write that? Because I can write a lot better than I articulate, I think, really. Um, you know, I can use lots of nice words in my book that I can think about rather than, you know, they don't come as um, as automatically as some people. But it was it was a good process. And, and I'm, I'm actually writing another book at the moment, which is I was writing a book with my son, but now we're writing two books separately about sort of um, a teenager growing up being in sort of show business and the pitfalls and all that kind of thing. We were writing it together, but now he's writing one, I'm writing one. So I'm sort of in the other book about 35,000 words in. So I'm nearly halfway now. So, um, but uh, you know, but, uh, to 2016, prior to that, I hadn't really been doing hardly any writing at all. You know, when I was editor of Penthouse, I was writing all the time and I wrote those other books. And then I really had a big gap, I think, from writing. The only thing I used to write is, you know, uh, sexy stuff. You know, um, you know, I've got some girls, I write some sexy stuff for their own fan site, you know. So I, I need to say some rude stuff, you know, can you write me this, this, this. So, the, so I'm doing like a serious sort of book and then I'm doing sexy stuff for, for <laughs> you know, so. But um, it's, it's all writing and you sit in front of a screen, you know you've got a, what you're going to do and you just do it, don't you? And that, I do like writing, but there are days, you know, like, right, I'm going to write three days this week. But if you get up on one of those days and you sit there and nothing comes, it's really annoying. You know what I mean? You can't schedule writing like that, you know. Um, and I don't like to write all five days a week because I like to, you know, I like to go out and have lunch with my friends or go to the gym or, you know, do other stuff or do, you know. So um, I do find that's the one frustrating thing about writing is it's... Um, if it's not coming, you, you might as well, and you'll do anything rather than write. You know, I think I'll have another cup of coffee. I don't even have <laughs> like 15 coffees and I'm still, you know, not getting anything down kind of thing. But uh, once you get going and you're doing something and, and you really think, oh, I like that bit, I like that bit. Once you get going, it, it can be very you know, satisfying when you, oh, I've done 2,000 words today and they're good words, you know, but some days that just doesn't come kind of thing. I want to big Alan because Alan, you are resident author. You must have a bit of a view on this. I can see you nodding a bit and smirking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I've um, I can relate to everything that Lindsay's saying. Um, yeah, especially when it comes to the days. I mean, just like today. I mean, I've I've got a deadline at the end of October, and I was going to write today, and I'm like, but I really don't want to. I just don't feel like doing it today. Yeah. So I can, you know, completely sort of. You Did know, you put something down? Sorry. Did you get something down? Did you do a bit of writing, or I, I booted the computer up, and um, my, my my problem is is that I tend to go through what I've already written, and that might take me a while. Yeah, <laughs> I re-edit everything, and yeah. like, I'll go back three chapters, and then I've spent two hours just looking at those three chapters, and I might have added three hundred words, but I've not added a great deal. But I think that's good because I think with writing a book. You know, even the day you're handing it to the publishers, if you had another 10 hours to sit and go through the whole book, I bet you'd change 50 things, you know, you just would, wouldn't you? Yeah, you I mean... You can editing, can you, with a book? This is it, and I think you kind of, you know, you have to have that cut-off point. I mean, because I've been writing for a few years now, so what I do... What do you write? Um, a, a couple of everything. I started out with uh, young, adult, uh, young adults, and then I've kind of since been sort of... Um, put in the box of like horror fantasy sci-fi so they're the ones that i tend to do most well with anything that's kind of in that sort of genre but um 
Yeah, but 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 it is. It's it, it, um, my my sort of philosophy is I, I I do it three times. I do the uh, uh, what I call the skeleton draft, which is the first one, just just getting your ideas down. Yeah. Um, then I'd go through it again, and that's when I kind of flesh it all out, and you yeah. know, add this to add the other. Maybe if there's an idea that I've had, I might put it in there. And then the third draft, I literally just go through and just to the best of my ability, edit it, and then yeah. that's it. Because like you said, if if you the more you go through it the more things you'll find to change. And there has to be that cut-off point where you have to give it to someone. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I know exactly what you mean. But um, it, it's tricky, though, because I just keep going back and changing bits. Even just moving words around, I think it's, I, I have a tendency to overwrite sometimes, you know, and you mm -hmm. think, actually, there's an extra... You know, I've said it three times. I don't need to say it three times. To, to be emphatic, it's nice to say it twice, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was writing sexy stuff, I mean, when I was writing sexy stuff for penthouse it didn't have to be intense you know i tried to make my sex scenes in my book quite intense and and then some you know you go back and you think right i've done all that but i want to go back and add in the senses you know like what did somebody smell like what did the room smell like you know all these kind of like tastes there all the senses in sexy books you know i have to throw all the senses in and then sometimes you think oh that's a bit too much that is you know so it's, it's keeping that line where you don't go too much i think isn't it with mm -hmm. Yeah. It's something like that and, and just over edit it so it you know you think where's the bones of it gone really I've just changed it too much so um but I do enjoy yeah. writing it's just but you've got to get that flow going and when you get that flow going there's nothing like it it's kind of weird you say that Colin probably knows if if, if Colin remembers this but I have an aspiration to write two books in my life um, yeah. one of them uh, I started writing when I first started working with Colin I don't know if Colin remembers it the book of man I do yes we're I going do, to call it yes. the book of man and it was a book to help ladies understand the mental um ins and outs of a brain's man and his faculties um, and um yeah, chapter seven was going to be called yes dear <laughs> it's going to be all the variations of why yes dear is the two most powerful words in a man's arsenal um and all the meaning and inflection behind that and the other one um i actually did start writing the i think colin you read the first few pages of it actually um my missus also read it and she loved it um but it's it's something that i'll do probably when i'm retired and the other one was um it's so much time and letter of future yeah. quick writing. yeah i and the thing is is for me it's it's stop and find the time and I'm, i remember once i sat in front of a computer and the world just zoned out and i started typing that was the first chapter of the book of man um, but I also want to write one on my life story, but I want to call it, forgive the rude word, shit in the toolbox. Um, the story of a tradesman. <laughs> shit in the toolbox. The story of a tradesman. Because well, I just think you... coming up through a trade, I started my career as an electrician, so I just thought it was an aptly named, and I can tell stories about when someone crapped in someone's toolbox. So. All right, you're just talking about shit. You've got so much rubbish in there that you can't find anything. Well, no, so, actual, shit, somebody actually did a dump in a toolbox. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's that's your gimmick. Yeah, that's, that's my author story. Um, can I ask um, a question of you, Lindsay? Um, uh, it's actually two, probably two. I'll start with the first one. If if you could have your uh, life story, your biography made in Hollywood now, who would you pick to play you? Oh goodness me! What what when I was young, obviously. Uh, well, any part you could do a trilogy. You could do your young years. You could have multiple well, actresses. I could have, I could have Sharon Stone playing me now because she's about the right age. So she and she's about she's blonde and yeah, not similar. Um, who would I have playing me young? Oh, I don't know. I'd say Sharon Stone from the older person. I'd need to, you know, I'd need to think of some sort of English. Middle age, who could I get middle age? I can't think of anyone really. Um, I'd like Aidan Turner to be a love interest in it, <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Hardy. <laughs> uh, who doesn't? Everyone yeah. loves Tom Hardy. Yeah, I, don't, loves, yeah. I don't see it, but there you go. A lot of ladies do, a lot of ladies do. Yeah, yeah no, my missus loves him. Anything with Tom yeah. Hardy, she'll watch it regardless. Yeah. So, yeah, him and Aidan Turner could be leading men, and I think they'd be, uh, they'd be very, very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. you, you did you have another question, Paul? Sorry. Yes, I do. Um, so it's uh, the question is basically um, from the career you've had. Um, is uh, let's just focus on uh, let's if we just take American Werewolf in London. Um, what if you can tell us were the positives, and also were there any negatives that came from being in the film? 
Um, the positives were here I am, I guess, talking to you 40 years later and I had a good time on it and got to go to some nice parties. But as I, I don't really, I don't think there were any negatives apart from the old boy staring down my cleavage and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> um, and um, no, I mean, there were, there were no negatives really. I mean, you know, you could sort of go and say, well, you know, you're a nude model and you get called a porn model. And, and, and it was funny because my, I mean, I was never really a porn model. I was the editor of, I was a glamour model, you know, I, I was a glamour model who took my clothes off. But I, you know, I did star in loads of porno films apart from, you know, the porno movie in, uh, which I pleased to say I starred in. But I remember my son was always going on telly and he's, he's yeah, so mum and dad are porn stars. And then he got so fed up saying, said, yeah, my dad's a porn star, but my mum is actually, she was editor of Penthouse and she's a glamour model. Can someone just get that? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I, I hated the fact that he, had, you know, he was always thrown that, you know, your mum's a porn star, your mum's a porn star, your mum's a porn star, you know. So I wasn't particularly happy about that, but that, that was nothing to do with American World in London. That was just because, you know, my career moved, you know, mainly, I mean, if I had to say what, I, I mean, I was a glamour model, really, and, and I got a few nice little parts in films, but my main job was, you know, doing leg modelling or doing the men's magazines, and then I went on to write in the men's magazines, and then I became the editor of Penthouse, which, you know, when I started writing for the, the magazine Club International, I was quite, quite well known as a glamour model, and the editor of Club International um, asked if I would mind doing, like, um, a regular diary in the magazine, <clears throat> pictures and 2,000 words. I said, yeah, yeah. They said, well, we'll send this person around to interview you and he'll write it about you. <clears throat> so they sent this guy around. I must have been 22, 23, something like that, 24. And um, they sent this guy around and he, he was probably about my age now. He was in his late 50s, early 60s. And he wrote this, this thing. And I mean, it was just, I live with my boyfriend and my two dogs. And I mean, I thought, well, these people are reading this magazines. They want the fantasy. They don't want all this. So I said to the editor, look, this isn't this isn't any good. Shall I have a go at writing it? And he said, well, you can if you want, you know. So I just sort of sat down and started writing um, and, you know, and, and a writing career came came from that, really. You know, I've got a job as editor of Penthouse. I've written five books. I know it's not huge amount of books, but I intend to write more. Um, just just because of, of, of a porn magazine that I ended up sort of starting to be a writer. So, you know, it's there's opportunities in all sorts of things you do, really, and you don't know where they lead kind of thing, do you? And and so being a glamour model actually lent, led on to me being a columnist and then a magazine editor. And, and then, um, you know, and then I started writing some books and stuff. So, you know, um, that was really good. Can I just say, during my tenure, I'm sure maybe the guys had similar uh, setups. During my tenure at high school, Club International was like hard <laughs> currency. If you had, if you were the guy <laughs> with the Club International, you were the most popular man in that playground. I tell you, mm -hmm. it was. Right, it's a very good magazine. And it's very good. Magazine. Yes. People still post pictures of it. From, no, because Twitter is the only thing that they let you post anything a bit raunchy on. And you know, I suddenly go on Twitter the other day, and someone's posted like four really old pictures of me that I, some of them I don't even remember seeing, you know. Um, but, and, you know, and people underneath said, oh, yeah, we still go, but I've still got my club internationals. Well, funny enough, I've still got a load of them in my loft, which I should <laughs> really. There's shops that sell all these old mags. I was going to say, yeah, you could yeah, probably sign them and sell them for a small fortune. Well, I think when I do a ne next convention, when we're out of lockdown, I probably will take some along because people, I did a, I did, I did a penthouse, the first ever nude magazine. I was still living at home, so the first ever nude magazine was I did a, for penthouse. <clears throat> and I was doing the convention and somebody brought that for me to sign. So, I mean, that was um, 40 years old, you know, and, and someone still had it. And they bought me and asked me to sign. And they were quite nice because, they, they, you know, it was a, a full uh, centre spread, naked job. And they, they asked me to sign it, you know, not because I didn't want to sign it on a next to Kimbo, right? You know, they asked me to sign on a nice little headshot that's sort of, I think I'm not on top of this, but you know, they asked me to sign it on a nice page, which I thought was nice. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Good, good, yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's amazing the sort of things you can do and the long, the uh, longevity of them. Uh, you, you never think about it at the time. Uh, I yeah. was, 
just just one thing I, you mentioned earlier that you don't watch horror films, which we're all more than happy with. But so, what is your your ideal film? You've got your bottle of wine, you've got your nice meal. What are you sitting down to? Well, I mean, I really am into sort of comedy films. I mean, I do like, um, you know, I, I like comedy. I mean, I like old. You know, old Steve Martin films. I love old Steve Martin films. I love oh, yeah. Adam Sandler movies. Um, I know Adam Sandler's done some right dodgy old films. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I suggest you stick with Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell just yeah, did Will some Ferrell's runs. Most yeah. of his stuff. He's done some great stuff, you know. So I, I really like, I mean, I'm just some, you know, I do quite like some deep sort of films that are um, some, a movie. Um, with Adrian Brody, I can't think what it's blooming called now. Where that it's, it was, it's based on the Stanford experiment. Um, where they, it's, oh, it's called the experiment. That's right. And they get, they they pay people to go into a test situation to see at what point some terms from a really normal, calm person, what point breaks them. And and they they, um, Forrest Whitaker is in it, and um, um, Adrian Brody, and they get they get them into a prison, and they have guards against prisoners and it just all kicks off and it's really violent and really like but it seriously makes you think you know and that's one of my kind of favorite films but then airplane as i was saying earlier you know that that daft film that's one of my favorite films as well you know and click adam sandler movie i mean i think cracking film cracking yeah, film watched it with son his girlfriend the other night and it's just all you know the, the, you can one minute you're laughing and then you're crying i do like <clears throat> something that can <clears throat> to do that and I mean something I've watched really recently which I think is amazing have you seen Afterlife with Ricky Gervais I haven't no it's on my I list I need it. to get around it's to it yeah literally in a half an hour tv show you will laugh 20 times and cry 20 times it's just like best television I've seen for <clears throat> a really long time so yeah so I, I like a few kind of he, things. Uh, Ricky Gervais's stuff I mean I watched The Invention of Lying and that I have to say that made me laugh and made me cry. He he knows how to hit hard on the emotional front. He's yeah, a very yeah. deep actor. Yeah, yeah. And, and the characters he builds in that afterlife, he gets, and he's got a lot of the characters that you'll see on TV, like Rasheen, I can't think of it, McConley, and, and quite a few bits, actors that you just see popping up. And he, and he brings them in, in this kind of way that you think, how has he suddenly got friendly with that person? And, that, and he builds these characters. It starts off in the first... Episode. And the characters just build, you know, their characterization is just like fantastic. And by the end, you love all the characters, you, you know, you're crying over them. And yeah, so I, think, I mean, it's something that I mean, I didn't like certainly like The Office used to make me cringe. It's brilliant, but it wasn't my kind of thing. You know, I couldn't yeah. watch Faulty Towers either. That used to make me cringe. I think probably my favorite sitcom on television is is black adder which i thought was... oh yeah yeah masterpiece oh, british comedy yeah amazing i, I was yeah. in black adder i was in black adder one actually i had a bit part in that which I was oh are you really yeah well there's oh, got to go back and see that it's the one i mean you you blink and you'd miss me it's it, mira margolis was in it and it was the spanish infanta in black adder one <laughs> yeah i know that one yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 her? no <laughs> her? no and I had a ginger wig on as well. So, because um, I used to do, when I was model, I used to do loads and loads of little bit parts. You know, I was in EastEnders and the Phil and all those kind of things. Usually playing a stripper or a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> I did mine and got me out of the house. It's funny because the Misty Moon that I do my conventions and shows and bits and pieces, that they do, they've been doing online shows and they did the bill the other day and I said oh I was on the bill so they got some of the actors from the bill but because I said I was on the bill they found the clip that I was in and I watched it and it was so over the top rude they <laughs> never show it on television now mm. and apparently someone watched it recently on television and they cut the whole scene it was oh, terrible man. and I was all over one of the policemen you know and terribly embarrassed and all that and they cut and the angle showing my bottom and everything and it was <laughs> they cut it out completely um, so I think things are a little bit toned down now, aren't they? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we are, certainly. I mean, I grew up with it. I was very young, but I, I grew up just around the time to know that kind of 80s TV, not politically correct, kind of out there pushing the boundary. Yeah. I think we're going to lose that. It's, it's a real shame. It's a real, I mean, I have, to be honest, I have no memory of the bill ever 
pushing the boundary. But I, I imagine if I went back and watched it, I, I would it's see where it happens. If yeah. You saw the 1986 show or whatever it was that I was in. You'd be shocked because they showed it out. It was this Zoom meeting, and it was like 50 people on the Zoom party, and then they ran the clips in, and I was actually quite horrified because I, <laughs> my God, that's, you know, because I think, and also people weren't expecting that. I don't think because I think. It wasn't a memorable scene that anyone would have particularly remembered, you know. And, they, and I thought, oh my God, this is this is quite because in those days my, I, I had a little acting agent, and um, sometimes I got sent by model agent, sometimes by acting agent. But it got to the point where I always went for stripper roles, and because I was like about five foot eight, long legs, blonde hair, big boobs. In the end, my agent didn't send anyone else; he used to just send me because I'd always <laughs> <get the> job. <laughs> time where I get yeah, everything it was great and they were only little jobs it wasn't like some big deal but you know so I was sending to should get that so you know all these sort of only fools and horses I did like I wasn't a stripper in that I was just some low neck thing for um a low neck dress for um all the people to like oh that kind of look so yeah I wasn't actually taking anything off but I was flashing it about I think so uh, that's that's I've been me but you know I, I've not had any problems with it. I've, I've really enjoyed doing these bit parts in, in film and TV and you know American Werewolf in London in particular because you know I've, I've revisited it so many times now because I've been talking about it and also because I wrote my autobiography in, nine, um, in 93 it was so when I did the one woman show and stuff one woman show I've been questioned and answering questions but um you know, I go back and read my book and I remember it because I wrote this autobiography when I was 33. Um, so I go back and read these things because otherwise a lot of it gets forgotten. Um, because, you, won't, you know, if you something you did that long ago, you don't remember all the nuances, you know. And I went back and I read, you know, what someone said, well, what's it like, you know, when you were interviewed by Ken Russell? Well, I just remember, yeah, I, I remember I went to London weekend telly and that's all I can remember. <laughs> Ken was very rosy cheeked and jolly. And, um, you know, had me dancing around his office, showing that I could do the moves. This was for something called the A to Z of British Music with Melvin Bragg, not for Ari. I did a few things with Ken. And, um, you know, but I'd forgotten all that. But because it was in my book, it was great. I could go back and, you know, so I've got quite a lot of memories that because I happened to write them down when I was in the 30s, that I've got to my 60s and I have forgot them. <laughs> That's brilliant. I think that's amazing. You can go back to a source reference for your own experiences. Oh, really? That's really brilliant. I love that. I love that. Oh, you know, I mean, we should all do it, whether, or, you know, whether you can even get it out and sell it or whatever. I think we should all all do that. I mean, I'm 43 and there's no way I can remember 23. Forget it. I just, it's no, a hate. You don't, but I think, obviously, I must have forgotten a lot. But because I wrote it when I was 33, that's probably quite a good time to write it because, yeah. you know, you do remember stuff then. Um, and because I, I, when I was doing a show, um, I did another sort of talking show in Darlington, it's a film club there, and um, somebody said, you know, you should do your autobiography part two, and because my novels are called Every Shade of Blue and Every Shade of Black, someone said you should call it Every Shade of Drew, and I thought that'd be quite a good, <laughs> it's quite good. <laughs> the title yeah. for my second autobiography if I ever do it, but this book I'm kind of doing my son's a bit down that road, so I probably, that'll be... That'll be enough talking about myself, I think, yeah. Great, great. Well, listen, this has been absolutely amazing. You've given us an hour of your time, which we really appreciate. Uh, you know, it's been so much fun f for me. I think I could speak for the other guys. Uh, we should probably give a shout yeah. out to Misty Moon because they put us in touch with you. So I'll, I'll thank Stuart on... Jen Morris, yeah, they're yeah. brilliant people. Oh, they're right? great guys, yeah, great guys. I'll, I'll send Stuart a little thank you note after this. Uh, obviously, we've, we've spoken about your books that are already out and the book that you're working on. I don't know if you've got a website or anything. If you send us that stuff, we'll get yeah, it under the I've video. Site that I've got my other two books on and, um, yeah, Lindsay's book, so I've got that. So I could, we, we can, I can email you this, you know. Later. Brilliant, yeah. That yeah, and with that, and I can put the I can put the um, Amazon on there, can't I? The Amazon. Yes, Amazon the, link. the links will be in the description on the YouTube. Well, if you're yes. watching this on YouTube, they'll be directly below the video. Well, can't hurt, can it? Can't no, hurt. no, definitely not. We and like I say, Lindsay, we've been you've given us uh, an amazing experience. I definitely this is one I will remember for sure because oh, it's been great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
hopefully, you know, if you we might have you back if you're happy to come back. You know, yeah. there's more we can more we can talk about. You know, eighty doesn't have to be a whole thing. We can talk about eighties and TV and the carry on films. I think we've got loads that we could quite happily get talking for another hour if we needed to. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, That's perfect. That's lovely. I've gotta... got enjoyed myself. Yeah, it's been good. I got me a glass of wine here and I got my dog here making me stroke him throughout the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> one, dog, one dog asleep in the crate there and another one who just won't leave me alone. I've just, but at least he hasn't barked. So he's he good... hasn't barked, no. He's been very good. He's been very good. Oh, Funny enough, good. my one's down here as well. And he's been good as well, not barking. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a staff sleeping. Oh, well, I've got a Bichon Freeze asleep, but I've got a Yorkie Poo here who just expects me to stroke his head throughout. But, um, it's been good, so I don't mind. But it's been lovely. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. So thank you, Lindsay, for your time. It's been much appreciated. Hopefully we'll get you back soon. Uh, but it's good night from the Outlaws. See you thank soon. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed myself. It's been lovely. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, guys. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, my dear. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.